Welcome to the Manu Mission Podcast, the show dedicated to unshackling ourselves from the status quo. Here's your host, H. H. Morris. Hello, my fellow freedom fighters and freedom lovers. Welcome to another episode of the Manu Mission Podcast. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm just going to jump right to it. All right. So the goal of the Manu Mission is to explore different ways that we can achieve greater freedom in our lives, which will allow us to live richer, fuller lives and thus lead us to greater happiness and fulfillment. But what does it mean when we say freedom? Is it simply about doing whatever we want? Those who are naturally inclined to be, inclined to be libertarians would answer yes, but would qualify the statement by adding, as long as you don't hurt anybody or their property. To me, it seems like there are a lot of people, maybe even most people, who are willing to accept this condition. So why is it so rare to see people actually live their lives accordingly? There are a lot of answers to that question, many of which we'll explore in the show, but today I want to discuss something that is crucial that we get right if we were to make any sense of the myriad of topics that we'll cover on the Manu Mission. I'm talking about rights. In order to build an ethical system around freedom, we have to be very clear and very precise about the way that we justify our our ideas, and the only way is by using first principles. The problem is that most of us have opinions of all sorts that are based on a lot of assumptions. Let me explain. Imagine that we start our lives with a blank slate in terms of ideas, and we call that point zero. And as we go through life, we develop and acquire differing ideas that get us to where we are today. But if we visualize that as a scale from 0 to 10, with 10 representing the beliefs that we hold today, right now, that entire scale of ideas is what we call our ideology, or the way that we justify our beliefs. But this process doesn't only happen at the individual level. In fact, it has been happening at a societal level before we were born. So most of the ideas that we acquire from point 0 to point 10 were part of a broader process. When society started from its point 0, I would identify that point as the beginning of civilization 10 to 12,000 years ago, a lot of concepts and ideas have been developed. But let's not pretend that civilization started with a clean slate as well. The first civilizations had many beliefs that carried over from our hunter-gatherer era, which included mostly mythology, superstitions, and a whole lot of pseudoscience. It wouldn't be until many thousands of years later that some people even begun to question a lot of those assumptions and try to get back to some sort of blank slate. Of course, I'm referring to the first philosophers like Thales and Democritus, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and so on. And since then, and at different times in history, some thinkers have attempted to reset their own beliefs in an attempt to build a belief system using what they consider clearer thinking or stronger evidence at that time. And a good example of that would be Rene Descartes, who explicitly did just that in his meditations. So just imagine how many ideas, good, bad, or indifferent, that we have in a way inherited from this process that we simply take for granted and assume is true. What are some of those common assumptions across the political uh, spectrum? So examples like everyone should receive a free education or my country is the best in the world or my personal favorite. We couldn't possibly have roads without the government. Now, some of you listening might actually hold at least one of those statements to be true. And odds are that that belief or those beliefs came to you from someone who took it for granted and held it as an assumption without examining them as well. For example, from your parents or teachers, celebrities, politicians, or even from subject matter experts themselves, you know, by directly studying their works. In most of these cases, including with experts, people's beliefs are formed by making a lot of assumptions that they build upon. Rarely do we take the time to test our beliefs or arguments to see if they would pass muster if we went back to point zero. Doing that, is, doing that is what some call arguing from first principles, which is essentially using reason and logic from that starting point and work your, your way uh, forward. Any concept or idea that does not fit in that sequence usually means that it was developed through sloppy thinking or that it came about by making an assumption or series of assumptions. So this is my attempt to get us back to point zero so that we have a common jumping off point where we can analyze competing ideas and theories and see what conclusions we can come up with without making any assumptions. And this approach already raises some questions, I, I presume, many of which you know 
you, you, you guys are, are probably thinking right now. So let me begin by addressing them since um, a few of those end up being the most frequent attempts to refute the very idea of rights to begin with. And I'll work big to small, starting with the most common refutations that regular, regular people make when uh, thinking about this topic and work down to more specialized arguments that you might get from folks who actually studied the issue in some detail or might even be experts in in a tangential field like scientists, doctors, engineers, and the like that inject what they do and what they know into philosophy. So the most common issue raised that many of you might already have in mind is the fact uh, or the reality of subjective experience. The reality that your life is different than mine, so that convincing each other of anything is often difficult and at times impossible because we see everything through a different lens. This is what's called moral relativism. Simply put, the idea that what is good and bad to someone is determined by that lens and everyone's lens is different, so we can't really get to a common truth. And there is some truth to this idea, ironically enough, but not enough to make it a valid argument. So we can all recognize that we have unique, unique experiences that have led us to form varying opinions and tastes. That is precisely what should drive us to attempt to find what, if anything, is objective. One main reason why folks cling to the issue of subjectivity is that they conflate aesthetics with ethics. What I mean by that is that people's observations that everyone has differing tastes in food, music, colors, personality traits, etc., and that there are just as many differing opinions on what is moral or immoral proves that there's no difference between the two. This phenomenon is further promulgated in people's minds because at point 10 in our scale of development of beliefs, when we turn around and look back towards point zero, we look back through our lens, which might be significantly warped and which might make everything look like it fits neatly together. And rarely do we try to break that lens to see how flawed our ideology is, much less go back to point zero and start again. But the best way to refute this type of sloppy thinking is by refuting its most extreme forms, which are nihilism and religion. Most most who are not religious are inclined to be moral relativists because of the reasons I outlined above. And religious people believe that there is truth in the world or the universe, and it's, it is what they believe was revealed to them by God and in their scriptures. But note that when we look at the fact that there's a numerous amount, amounts of uh, religions, many of which contradict each other, then we're pretty much back where we started, right? So while religious people will agree that there is obje objectivity in the world, oftentimes what they hold as objective or as truth is also based on a lot of assumptions. Nihilists, on the other hand, hold that in the realm of human experience, there is nothing objective and thus we cannot come to any truth. But if we begin with their main argument, there is no truth, right away we see the problem. If we were to believe that statement, then we would be agreeing that there is some truth. At the very least, that one statement. So you can see that it's a self-contradictory belief that can be easily discarded. Moral relativists and nihilists tend to be very vocal, staunch supporters of their beliefs, and you only need to encounter one in a political or philosophy uh, forum to see that, uh, which is puzzling because why waste any time or effort on convincing people, right? I mean, if everything is subjective and there's no such thing as truth, then, then what's the point of trying to convince others? So here we see another flaw in, in their approach. This is best seen through argumentation ethics, which we'll talk about um, again when, when I get into the, the topic of rights. But simply put, argumentation ethics states that the mere fact of entering the debate or, or posing arguments has consequences, and we can make observations on, on, on those consequences. The most obvious one being what I pointed out before, the argument where that there is no truth is a self-defeating one. I also alluded to the fact that moral relativists and nihilists are stalwart supporters of their beliefs and argue their points forcefully. From that, we can only conclude that they hold some value in convincing other people of the validity of their ideology, but why? Could it be that they believe that it would be beneficial for everyone to believe the same thing and have a common starting point? If so, isn't that an objective observation that they're on their part and the rudimentary beginnings of an ethical system? To that, if they answer, well, I just enjoy the mental stimulation and find it fun to have these discussions and uh, even if they don't really accomplish anything in the big scheme of things, well, that isn't any different. 
They are admitting to the fact that it is objectively valuable to engage others in discussion, even if it's only for enjoyment, which sounds a lot like the beginnings of Epicureanism or Hedonism or even Stoicism in a way, all of which are ethical systems. And I won't bother you uh, with examining those today. But if you ask me, any moral relativist or nihilist response when someone disagrees with them should be, okay. I mean, anything more than that, as argumentation ethics shows, shows us, is a confession that there is such a thing as objectivity in the realm of human affairs, namely, whatever it is that they're arguing for or against. And we'll talk a little bit more about argumentation ethics when we um, uh, finally get to, to the topic of rights. So now... I hope it's starting to become clear to everyone that this endeavor of building an ethical system from scratch is possible and legitimate, but we're not done yet. In order for us to also glean why this is possible in the first place and why it's important to do it, we have to begin with a clean slate at good old point zero. And here we have to ask ourselves, so think back to argumentation ethics, what can we learn from the mere fact that we are engaged in this endeavor? Do rocks ask themselves these questions? How about trees or amoebas or elephants? No. Only humans engage in this. And that can serve as a, as a jumping off point. If we're the only beings that can do what we're doing here today, then we have to first identify what makes us unique in relation to other life forms. And so we acknowledge that we have a lot in common with other animals, especially mammals, in our capacities to have emotions and ability to interact with our world around us. Yet we also see ourselves as distinct from them. How do we account for that? Well, the main three characteristics that separate humans from other living creatures, from single cell organisms to the most intelligent mammals, such as apes, are consciousness, reason, and free will. And all three of these are interrelated and could be considered all functions of the second one, of, of reason. But it's important to understand them and their different components and their impl implications. So... Let's begin by taking a look at consciousness. This doesn't mean simply being awake. I mean, we lose consciousness about eight hours out of every day. It's called sleep, right? What I'm referring to is self-awareness or the ability to recognize that you exist. So unlike other creatures, even the most intelligent ones, humans locate themselves in space and time, which allows them to also be aware of concepts like past, present, and future. This has significant implications as we'll see when we discuss the third characteristic, but with this also comes the awareness of your own mortality, which is also unique to humans. The second characteristic is the ability to reason. And this is the linchpin from which the other two conditions arise. And I say that because science and medicine tell us that it's mainly due to the capacity of the human brain that we get all three characteristics. It appears that there is some sort of tipping point in brain size and development that makes humans intelligent enough to develop self-awareness and free will, and which we'll discuss shortly. Now, it's important that we also understand exactly what we're talking about when we refer to reason. We know that many animals are intelligent and can solve simple problems. In this case, I'm referring to the ability to solve complex problems and hold abstract concepts like time, mathematics, and you know what we're doing here right now. And I break out reason or intelligence in the three main categories because just going by intelligence has some problems. I mean, theoretically, we can conceive of a computer that is smarter than any human in its capacity to hold information and solve problems, but that still wouldn't necessarily mean that it would have self-awareness. And I'll leave it to the experts on AI and technology to address that problem better than I could, but suffice it to say, we can imagine a cyborg whose program is so advanced that its behavior is completely indistinguishable from a human, and it still might not be self-aware. In addition, and that takes us to the third characteristic, the cyborg would still be limited by its, program, its programming and not act volitionally. Okay, so then what can we say about free will? Again, there are plenty of other life forms in the world, including some with brains and significant intelligence. And as I, said, as I mentioned, they are still not self-aware and cannot reason to the degree that we humans can. From that fact, we can also observe that those creatures' behaviors are programmed to a large extent, and we call that instinct. So imagine if you were to put a group of beavers on the top of a skyscraper. It would immediately start looking for trees to chop down, right? I mean, that's what they do. 
they would not sit and have an existential crisis about their predicament and lament the fact that they might never see their dens and their families again or that they didn't get to do all the things that they wanted to do or reminisce about the good old days back in the river, right? No. They would do or try to do what beavers do. And as animals, humans also have instincts, but our capacity to reason allows us to reach escape velocity, if you will, with regards to our instincts. In other words, we can suppress our animal instincts and decide to act against them if we choose. If humans, like in the beaver example, find themselves in a completely foreign environment, they would also have a survival instinct, except it would manifest itself in a different way. They would start looking for a way out or ways to manipulate the new environment to get what they need to survive, all while they might be suppressing other instincts. For example, in such a predicament, the group might, the people in the group might conserve their food and water until they can find other sources, or if, um, even if they're experiencing severe hunger and thirst you know, during that whole time. So in short, humans can decide what to do based on an almost infinite amount of choices, which are only possible thanks to the ability to reason. All right, so I know that's a lot, guys, so bear with me. Let me grab a drink here because my mouth's getting dry from all this talking. Talk among, amongst yourselves. Okay, so now that you know we've reached a consistent and universal idea of the human condition, we can send out, set out in our quest to find out what rights are. But a quick side note on the word universal. When I use that word, I mean that something is universally true and that any and all exceptions are so rare or so absurd that they prove the rule. So, for example, when dealing with the three universal human characteristics that I just covered, one can expect a rebuttal like, so someone who is in a coma or in a vegetative state is not human, or are we not human when we sleep since we're not aware? Um, I hope it's clear to most people that the former example is very rare and the latter is just absurd. So when starting from point zero, we have to deal with the rule, not the exceptions. And that's not to say that some of those exceptions don't need to be accounted for and dealt with, but that comes way further on down the line. Okay, so now we can finally start getting some work done. Ask yourself, why even bother with trying to find out what is moral and what isn't? And as you'll see, all of the things that I've discussed so far have implications that will help us answer this question, but... Before that, let me give you a scenario. This is a mental exercise that we'll visit often on this show, and many philosophers have used it in the past. It's not anything new. But it's very useful when starting from point zero or when putting our existing beliefs to the test if we suspect that they might be based on assumptions. I call it the island. So imagine that you get shipwrecked alone on a deserted island in the middle of the ocean. Let's assume that you are a veritable Bear grills survivalist type and that the island has all the flora and fauna and natural resources you would need to live the rest of your life there if no one ever came to rescue. All right, well, what can we say about such a condition from a human perspective vis-a-vis -vis an ethical system? Why do we need one on, on this island? We don't, right? I mean, the only reason why anyone would even be interested in doing any of this is because we're trying to get to some objective conclusions about how humans should interact with each other. But there's a lot that we can deduce logically from the single person in the island that will help us later on. Since we're trying to get to a point where we can glean what, if any, are human rights, we have to discern between what exists and what doesn't exist. Remember our capacity to reason and have abstract thoughts? This is where they come into play. See, rights don't exist in the real world. You can't see them or touch them or taste them. The concept exists because we can come up with them due to our capacity to, to reason, just like the concept of 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now, that equation and the numbers that comprise it also don't exist in the real world, yet it is a valid concept that is objectively true and can have real implications and consequences in the material world, as we'll see later. So when Bear Grylls shows up to the deserted island, there are a lot of objective observations that we can make about him and about humans as a whole that, although don't come into play since he's alone, we can use to start building a system of ethics. So keep in mind, 2 plus 2 equals 4 was true and valid in the island, even before Bear showed up. And it had it just had no implications in reality because there wasn't anyone to implement mathematics. Similarly, when Bear shows up to the island alone, 
the objective observations we make about him and humanity by extension will help us identify natural human rights that will hold even though being alone they do not have any practical purpose for bear um okay so what are those objective observations let me illustrate the following point by referring to a message message that i received a, a while back when i first started talking about rights especially property rights a listener wrote th and and stated that he was confused about property rights and how they are justified since you know you're born with just your body and die with just your body you can't take any property with you and what the listener failed to realize was that the answer was right in his own question the observation that we are born with nothing but our bodies eluc elucidates the fact that they are indeed our property they belong to us so here we have the foundation for everything that we refer to as natural rights and it's a confluence of everything we've talked about thus far our argumentation ethics and the universal characteristics that we identified in humans will help us flesh that out so let's see how that works but let's not make any assumptions if we are going to make a categorical statement that we own our bodies we have to be able to account for that we're at point zero after all and there are only three possibilities one either we own our own bodies or two we all own each other's bodies equally or Three, we don't own our bodies nor anybody else's. So I think it's pretty clear what the only thing that is logical, uh, or the only thing that is logical is the first option. I mean, if no one owns their own bodies, then who does and how would that be justified? If we all own each other equally, meaning one seven billionth of each other, how would that even work? So logic tells us that we own our own bodies and argumentation ethics further supports this the following way. The mere fact that I'm using my brain, mouth, vocal cords, etc., to communicate these concepts to you evinces that I have dominion over my body, its parts, and its functions, and nobody else does. Furthermore, if we think back to our three universal characteristics of humans, the fact that I have a capacity to reason and have free will, it follows that I am then responsible for my decisions and my actions. In other words, I'm a moral actor or a moral agent. And like an animal, if I have the capacity to analyze all my options and have the free will to choose between them, I can be held responsible for the consequences of those actions since those actions are implemented with my body, which is my property. Okay, so where does that put us? Well, we have established that we own our bodies and everything we do with them. If that were not the case, then we would not be able to be held responsible for anything that we do and we would not be moral actors or moral agents. I doubt that anyone would make such a case. But let's take the opportunity to define what we mean by property, since this is also a point of contention for a lot of people because the concept of ownership is, is a vague one. And the simplest way to define this is by going back to the ownership of our own bodies. When we say that we own them, what do we mean? Well that we control them directly, that we have final say as to how they're used or not used. And although strange to say when talking about bodies, how ownership is, is transferred. So, you know, think of being an organ donor or donating, donating your body to science after you die or something like that. But to summarize this, ownership means one, the right to determine how something is used or not used, and two, the right to determine the why, how, when, and to whom ownership is transferred okay so i just mentioned rights um and i don't want you to think that i'm just assuming them so let's elaborate on the concept of rights let's go back to bear on the island we established like that like every other human the only universal law that is logically possible is that he owns his body another universal observation that we can make about this his condition is that by the very nature of his existence he must employ his body in an effort to survive, okay? So food, water, shelter, etc. they don't magically appear in front of him when he needs them and in the quantities that he needs them. So he must forage for food, hunt, build a shelter, or find one that he can approve upon and fashion clothing that will protect him from the elements as, as he does all, the, all of those things. The freedom to do what he needs to survive is inherent to his existence, and necessary to the survival of his body, which as the owner of it, he 
probably wants to maintain or not. He can forfeit that and give up, you know, due to despair and loneliness in the island and jump from the highest cliff on, on, on the island. And he's free to do just that as well. But note that since he's alone, Bear is free to do all the things that he needs to do to survive. He's free to do so. But rights don't come into play yet. Let's say that Bear has been in the island for a year. And by this point, he has already fashioned rudimentary tools that have allowed him to harvest wood, to build a house, hunt, and he's cleared some land where he has planted several varieties of fruits and vegetables. If we are to assume rights at this point, what do we make of the fact that Bear is constantly having to fight off animals that try to and often succeed in taking his food? Or that termites are routinely eating away at his wooden tools and furniture or his house and that he's constantly having to repair or replace them. If all of those things are his property and we say that he has the right to them, how does that help him? It doesn't. We know that since animals don't have the capacity to reason or have free will, they have no moral agency, so it would be fruitless to talk about rights in this case. His only option is to plan accordingly. Animals cannot conceptualize rights any more than they can conceptualize 2 plus 2 equals 4. And it doesn't matter how object, uh, objective those concepts are. So his approach in dealing with the animals on the island that, that are a threat to his property is no different than the way that he deals with the weather. Reinforce, strengthen, prevent, defend, etc. When we talk about rights, we're talking about something that is owed to someone. Imagine trying to convince an animal or insect that they owe you something, anything. Absurd, right? However, simply owing something to someone doesn't give us a universal definition that we need to build a system of ethics. I can say that as a member of a certain club, I have the right to access what to access, you know, X, whatever. Well, that can't be universalized because it's dependent on someone being a member of the club, paying their dues, etc. And that is why talking about rights is tricky. One can use semantics to turn almost anything into a right. But just because that's possible, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I recently watched a, a video by Stefan Molyneux where he decries the use of the term rights precisely for this reason. But I personally disagree. Just because something can, can be or has been corrupted doesn't mean that it can be that, that should be eliminated altogether. I prefer, you know, adding clarity or disabusing people. Otherwise, it's just like saying that even though I believe that people should be able to protect themselves with guns, I now change my mind because guns have been used to kill good or innocent people at some point. You know, but I digress. In any event, what we're looking for in determining natural rights are those that can be universalized and that don't contradict themselves or other rights. By them being universal, I mean that they would apply to all humans anywhere in the world, from Bears Island to the most populated uh, metropolis in the world, with any few exceptions uh, proving the rule, as we covered earlier. By not being contradictory, I mean that for some to be considered, or for something to be considered a natural right, it cannot abrogate or preclude another right. Okay, so let's explore this further. We have already established the objective reality of self-ownership, or more precisely, the ownership of our own bodies. We have also seen that this is a natural condition of humans and thus can be universalized. In addition, you owning your body does not preclude me from owning mine and vice versa. So we can establish the cornerstone of natural rights theory as the right to property. Since we have also shown that as a moral actor, I'm responsible for the consequences of my actions, then by extension, the fruits of my labor, again, the employment of my body, are also my property. To so think of Bear and all the things that uh, he has created in his first year on the island. And here we can do a quick uh, point zero test for, you know, for something that might be considered a natural right at point 10. Let's say that another person washes up on the island. So we want to test assumed right you know, something that we assume at point, C, uh, point 10, sorry. Um, that being, all humans have the right to a free education, okay? Well, what would that look like on the island? Well, the way that it 
is stated, it sounds universal, right? All humans, all people, but it actually cannot be universalized because, I mean, what constitutes an education? I mean, say that the only thing that Bear can teach the new person on the island are survival skills. No math, no history or literature. You know, do you see the problem here? But even if we assume that Bear is a polymath who can teach every possible subject that one would find in the university, the right to a free education implies that the newcomer would be justified in compelling Bear to educate him or her by force if necessary. Would that not be a violation of Bear's right of self-ownership? If he has the right to determine what to use his what to use his body for and how, how can it be that he can be forced to do something that he might not want to do? Now, in the latter case, he probably would want to do it, given that we're dealing with his only companion on the island, and it's in his best interest for both of them to be educated and skilled um, in order to have a better shot at a more uh, productive life. But the fact is, is that it, the fact is that it's possible that Bear has nothing or very little to teach. Again, we don't even know what education means according to those who make the propositions. And that even if he can teach it, if he could teach it all, he might not want to, proves that the proposition cannot be universalized, universalized and that it would also abrogate Bear's property rights. In other words, the right to a free education, in fact, is not, in fact, a natural right. Okay, so this example also um, provides the opportunity to address another facet of natural rights, which are negative versus positive rights. And if you've noticed the right to property that extends from the natural condition of owning your body only implies that things can't be done to you or your property. And that is the definition of a negative right. In the previous example of the right to a free education the proposed right is something that should be done for, you know, done to you, for you, or on your behalf. That is the definition of a positive right. And as we saw, such an attempt requires violating someone else's rights. So as a rule of thumb, positive rights do not meet the criteria of being universal or of not violating other, other rights in their application. And that's why when we refer to natural rights, we only refer to negative rights, which can be defended using first principles, as we, we've done here. Okay, so I think at this point I should make a clarification. I'm sure that many of you have studied rights theory at some point in you know, philosophy class in high school or college. And so you probably learned the traditional form of basic rights as life, the rights to life, liberty, and property. And those of you listening in the U.S. are probably more familiar in the way that Thomas Jefferson expressed them in the, the uh, Declaration of Independence as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This comes mainly from British thinkers of the Enlightenment and the classical liberals like Adam Smith, John Locke, Dave, David Hume, and the aforementioned Thomas Jefferson. And the reason why I don't frame natural rights in that way is that I find it easier to understand and more effective to communicate by showing that all rights are property rights. So let me explain. So let's take the first one on the list, the right to life. Using first principles, we came to the conclusion that we own our bodies. That means that the right that we know as the right to life really is just an extension of your body being your property and what essentially houses your life. You know, it's the, the repository of your life. Someone who murders you or tries to murder you can only do it by attacking your body, which is your property. The right to liberty is no different. As the owner of your body, you determine how to use it. So any attempt to force you to do or not do something, again, an abrogation of your property rights. If you look at the, the Bill of Rights, for example, you're dealing with a lot of very specific rights that are recognized, such as free speech, the right to arm yourself, freedom from searches and seizures, the right to practice any religion, blah, blah, blah. From that, you know, or for, I mean, from what you know now, these are all just logical extensions of your inherent right to property by way of your body. And through this standard, we can determine if there are any provisions in any constitution that violate this right, like we just did in the previous example on the island. 
when we do that, we find that laws such as taxation, compulsory education, universal health care, etc., are all positive rights that don't satisfy the criteria for basic or natural rights. So I hope you agree that this is a simpler, more straightforward way of, of dealing with rights theory. So instead of simply t- testing a litany of different rights, like those found in the Bill of Rights, uh, or the ones that people in different parts of the world claim as rights, I wanted to make it clear to you that once we establish the cornerstone of natural rights in the form of the right to property, we can also find an objective principle that supports that concept, the non-aggression principle. Basically, the universal principle that recognizes property rights of individuals and that the initiation of force against said property is immoral and illegitimate. And this principle also meets our criteria of universality. It can exist equally among all humans at the same time and in all places. And it does not abrogate any other natural right. In the island, Bear and the new resident of the the island um, have two choices, essentially. They can either treat the other person as they would the other animals on the island and act like animals themselves, trying to take each other's food, raiding the their houses for valuable things, fighting over territory, or so on. Or they can use their ability to reason and use first principles to acknowledge the right to property and abide by the NAP, the non-aggression principle. Note that these concepts are not magical. 2 plus 2 equals 4 will allow you to better navigate the world. And by that, I'm just you know using the example to mean math- mathematics, right? It will allow you to better navigate the world around you and to manipulate your environment more efficiently and effectively in order to improve your quality of life. But you don't have to implement it. So similarly, although the right to property in the NAP are objective and true based on first principles, they're also not magic. People can opt to live counter to those concepts. In fact, most people do. But that has consequences just like building a skyscraper without using mathematics. So Bear and his companion can decide whether to live according to the law of the jungle, as he did you know, when, when he was alone, and in fact treating the other person like an animal and he himself act like an animal. Or they can live in relative peace and cooperation under the NAP. Okay, so there you have it, folks. A primer or primer on rights and the non-aggression principle that will serve as our guide for a lot of interesting and complicated topics that we'll discuss in the future. But before I leave you, let me make a final point. We started our discussion, uh, or we started discussing the importance of going back to point zero in order to challenge our our beliefs or question our, our, our existing beliefs. If we do see that as a starting point, my goal isn't to have everyone's line from 0 to 10 be the same one as me. In fact, those lines radiate from the center in their own directions. And that's what I refer to as the spokes in the wheel of society. The perennial problem is that many of those spokes are either broken and have differing different lengths and strengths, which makes for a very bumpy ride. However, if we base our beliefs on solid arguments and first principles, we can give that wheel a better shape and thus we can have a smoother ride. Don't go anywhere. All right, I hope you guys like that. So today I want to go over just a few of the things that are happening in the world and I really wish we'd talk a lot more about what's going on out in the world and uh, stay away from mostly you know this U.S. centric stuff but it's it's impossible right now guys it still uh, hasn't gotten much better than the last time we spoke last week and I discussed how everything's just upside down and um, it doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. So obviously the, the thing that's all over the news still is uh, the fact that, or not the fact, the claims that Russia hacked the U.S. elections and all this crap. 
And of course, it's all bunk, right? I mean, essentially, all they're saying is that they influence the election. I mean, if they could show some proof that Russian agents actually came in and hacked the electronic voting machines and they added votes for Trump or something to that effect, right? That would be a hack. But basically, they're just saying that they influenced them. And um, and so after the, the result of all of this uh, hoopla is amazing to me because, again, the Dems, remember, the Democrats are now the party that's pro-CIA. Because remember, they're claiming that it's the CIA that's, that's uh, saying all this and that can prove all this. So now they're holding CIA as as an organization that is beyond reproach again and these are the same people that have been complaining about them for the last 15 years starting with uh well i mean all forever but i mean in in the recent uh, in recent history starting with the the wars in the middle east and you know afghanistan 9 11 um iraq the uh, phony the phony intelligence about weapons of mass destruction all that kind of stuff so they're but they're now holding them in, in uh, on a pedestal so Again, and now it's the conservatives who are anti-CIA. Okay, what the hell's going on? Well, except the old guard. You can st- still see uh, folks like um, John McCain and uh, Lindsey Graham, some of those old um, old guard uh, neocons, neocon types, still uh, supporting the CIA and, and get, lending them credence. But, you know, those guys are dinosaurs and they can go to hell. But um, And then... Now, also, the Hillary and, and her supporters, um, you know, are also now against the FBI, and they have blamed Comey for her loss, okay? And again, let's talk about consistency here. So first, um, Hillary and her supporters commended Comey because he didn't, he basically didn't charge her, okay? And the Republicans were going nuts about that and then he comes back and he says hey you know we're reconsidering so then the hillary and her supporters decry the fbi and republicans then say yes finally you're doing your job see of course you we knew we all knew you got were good guys all along and then he comes back and says yeah no we didn't change our opinion after further review and then uh, the Republicans are again say, well, what are you talking about? You're, you're full of it, blah, blah, blah. And then now Hillary still says that it was Comey, even though, again, in two different instances, he decided not to charge her with, with a crime, which he basically outlined exactly what she did wrong. And all of those things were, were crimes. He just decided not to charge her. So amazing. So now we're also at a point where the left are the imperialists, you know, and following some folks on social media, you see how many leftist uh, journalists are calling for taking military action against Russia, folks. Can you believe this? A nuclear superpower? And this is, you know, from the people that have been telling us for how long that, uh, or for, you know, for the eight years of Bush that, you know, the warmongers and to stop bombing brown people all over the world and blah, blah, blah. And now, you know, first of all, they've been quiet for the eight years of Obama. Well, he's been doing the exact same thing. And now they want to go to war or risk a war with Russia. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's just absolutely. And now suddenly the neocons, well, not neocons, neocons will always like war, but the the conservatives in general are now back to being the non-interventionists. You know, they say, hey, don't start crap with Russia and we don't want to be in Syria. Let's get the hell out of there. So (sighs) topsy-turvy, folks, topsy-turvy. It's uh, it's getting crazy out there. So. This is precisely the reason why on my next episode, I'm going to talk about the real um, political spectrum because it's so it's so confusing. It's very hard to keep everything straight when you when you see things flipping back and forth like that. You say, well, what's the left? What's the right? What's Republican? What's Democratic? What's, you know, liberal and conservative? So it's very, very confusing it's important that we get that we get these things straight because uh it that's the easiest way for for the ruling class to manipulate us and um 
once we see through them and the fact that they're basically just opportunists and they're willing to go back and forth um, in, in both sides of those of the ideological line, you'll see that it's really all about convenience. So um, look forward to that. And went a little long on the first section today, so I'm not going to uh, keep you too much longer. But I did want to share on a personal note something very surreal that happened to me. And I just realized, you know, early last week. And it seems like I'm um, two degrees separated from uh, the Trump administration. <laughs> and this was really funny, guys. It was pretty surreal when, when I realized that. I actually told my wife I, that it turns out that a, a friend of mine, really a friend of my sister's, who, you know, she's a, a good friend of hers, um, she is the uh, fiancé of Trump's nominee for Secretary of the Treasury. And I had not put two and two together because, I mean, I've known her for a while, for several years. Like I said, she's a uh, friend of my sister's. And I knew that she was um, dating at that point. Right now, they're they're um, engaged to, you know, some billionaire guy, whatever. Never, I've never met him uh, personally. I've met her several times, but not him. And um, I never, I didn't put two and two together when they announced um, Steven Mnuch Mnuchin as the nominee for Secretary of the Treasury. And then the other day, I'm like, Oh my God, that's this girl's, um, this girl's fiance. And I don't know, it was just very surreal, just a very surreal, um, realization to, to know that, oh yeah, I've, you know, hung out uh, several times with, with someone that's uh, essentially going to be married to the next secretary of the treasury. No, I don't know. I just wanted to share that because I thought it was funny and it's, uh, like I said, just very surreal. So, um, I hope at some point for however it comes about that I am able to somehow ever, you know, sit and talk to this guy. Cause I'd love, I'd love to ask him a few questions <laughs> as, you can, as you can imagine. So, I mean, this guy is an, you know, billionaire, ex Goldman Sachs guy, uh, ex Indy Mac guy, uh, you know, definitely not, uh, who I would have chosen. Um, especially when I know that he had interviewed a few, a few other folks that were much more libertarian, that were anti-Fed. Uh, I believe he even interviewed someone from the Cato Institute. I forget his name, and um, and just knowing, you know, what some of his thoughts were on sound money, again, the Federal Reserve, all those things. I was, you know, who I was hoping would get in there because if there was any any uh, chance of anything being changed, it would have been with with someone like that, and not with uh, with uh, Mnuchin, obviously more of a establishment guy and a crony so we'll see we'll see what happens and and if anything ever comes of that on my end and if i ever get the opportunity to meet him of course or anything like that i'll you guys will be the first to know but as you can tell my voice is about to give out guys so um thanks so much for joining me today um stay tuned for next week when we'll discuss uh everything else that's going on in the world i'll try not to go so long on the first section so that we can discuss more current events and uh not bash you over the head with theory and um you know dense stuff like that okay we'll talk next week if you want to know how you can help me keep the show going or if you have a question comment or recommendation you can contact me directly or through social media find out how to do all that by visiting manumission.com